did you hear about this one? How did you hear about RBSS and how did it come to the forefront? I was, yeah, I was traveling around with my last film, Cartel Land, and uh, ISIS was sort of becoming front page news, and I was trying to understand this phenomenon and see if there's a film to be made, and uh, came across this article by David Remnick in The New Yorker about these guys, and just right when I read it, I knew that this was my way into the story, and uh, I reached out to the guys, and um, a week later, I started filming. And where were you? Were you you were in Turkey and Germany and anywhere? Where did you go? Tell us about the actual filming, because I know with Cartel and you were really embedded in with those people. Was it similar in that way? Did you feel like it was um, as kind of hectic? And what did you? What, what were the differences? Yeah, so I, I, I never went to Syria. Um, I would have been killed. I mean, you can go to Syria in different places in Syria, but if you, you know, if I went to Raqqa, I would have been killed instantly. Um, so I, I was never in Syria. I filmed all stuff outside in Turkey and Europe and, and you know, Germany. Um, it was a completely different experience. Uh, you know, cartel land. I was in very physical danger, obviously, and, and, and you know, in shootouts and meth labs and torture chambers and all sorts of, you know, very frightening situations. And um, in this, the danger was much more amorphous. You know, I was in these safe houses with these guys, but I, I never saw ISIS, I never saw guns, I never saw dead bodies, I never saw um, any of it. But I, I, you sort of felt ISIS everywhere. Um, and so it was just a different type of fear and a different experience. And how, can you give us an update about how everybody is? Adi, everybody? Yeah, um, I was just with Aziz. Um, he's, he's here in town, actually. Um, they're all alive. The guys in the film are all alive. They're all um, still operating. Um, there's still a group on the outside, and then there's still a group on the inside who are still reporting. Um, the geopolitical situation in, in Raqqa is, is quite different when the film ended, um, you know, there's a, a ground offensive um, led by the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is a conglomerate of a few different militia groups um, funded and backed by the U.S. Um, that are currently trying to oust ISIS from Raqqa um, after months and months and months and months of bombing the city. Um, and it could be a week, it could be months, until ISIS is, 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 uh, is out of there. But I think, you know, as, as he says in the film, and as, as, as the guys have taught me, um, you know, they're fighting an idea. They're fighting an ideology. And this ideology and this idea uh, won't be um, won on the traditional battlefield. It won't be beaten with, with guns or with bombs. Um, and I think we, as a, as a global community, as governments, as citizens, as journalists, as whomever we all are, um, need to figure out ways to combat this ideology, this perversion of Islam um, that doesn't represent, you know, the vast, vast, vast majority of, of people. Um, and tell us a little bit about, um, I mean, I'll throw it out to you guys if you guys have any questions, but tell us, you know, you're really such an intimate um, documentary filmmaker, do you ever feel kind of strange um, duplicity about being an observer but also being involved? And how do you negotiate that? You know, you obviously you obviously care a great deal about these people, and so is that hard for you? Is it hard for you to kind of remember to stay on the outside and not get too involved but at the same time? As you can tell from the film and from Cartel and from the film Cartel and you obviously really care so deeply about these people and about these issues. So, or do you just not think about it? Maybe in Cartel and you didn't have time to think about it. Just so you all know, after I saw Cartel and when I saw Matt again, I was so glad he was alive. <laughs> but I didn't even care about the movie. <laughs> Couldn't believe he was alive. Anyway, um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a strange thing what I do, I guess, um, because my goal is to really get these extraordinarily intimate moments, and I, I you know, it doesn't happen just by sort of, you know, knocking on their door and hanging out with them for a day. It happens after weeks and weeks and months and months and months of relationship building and trust building and rapport building and um, becoming sort of a part of the fabric of their daily lives. And, you know, there's, it's a very sort of complicated moral type of often, um, especially sort of exhibited in, in that final scene with disease. You know, as a human being, all I wanted to do was give him a hug. Um, you know, he was having some version of a panic attack and shaking and um, deeply distressed, obviously. Um, but you know, my job also was to capture this moment. And, and you know, and I constantly find myself in those sort of uncomfortable places where um, my instincts as a human being are, are in, in conflict with my instincts as a, as a filmmaker. So maybe if you know, if you keep in mind the bigger picture, you know that you're um, eventually what you're gonna get on screen is gonna reach more people and be and you know potentially move more people, and um, then maybe that makes it slightly easier in the moment. Totally, yeah. And, you know, I think um, these these guys have been through more than any of us could ever imagine. You know, they were tortured and. and Arrested by the Assad regime, tortured and arrested by ISIS. Friends, colleagues, family members killed by ISIS, forced to be on the run, living in safe houses, continuing to get death threats. And so um, it was amazing the sort of stoicism with which they carried themselves. But I knew that behind that there must be something. Mm -hmm. um, and so that something was something that I was trying to find, and I didn't find it really viscerally or originally until I got that scene. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, after that scene, that scene was like one long sort of 90 minute take uncut. Um, but afterwards, you know, Aziz and I stayed up till like five or six in the morning talking and eating, you know, we went to have a meal and you know, it's had a complicated sort of relationship. But you know, I care deeply about him and so, um, and is he, is he still on the run? He's still in safe houses? I mean, yeah. He, I mean, he... Um, He's allowed into this country by our president? He will no longer be allowed back. Um, yes. Awesome. <laughs> he, he, was, he got in before the latest um, ban, and um, that, I just did, came from another Q&A with him, and that was the, probably the last q and I'll do with him. Um, do you guys have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Should I, do you? Yeah, I'm just wondering how, uh, when you first presented the idea of doing a documentary about the people that you were asking. Um, somewhere between open and not open. <laughs> yeah, how quickly can you break out your camera? You know, how much, how, yeah. It's a really good question. Quickly, normally. I always find that like, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, a first date, I guess, like that, that first initial approach is really, really important. Um, and so, you know, I always want them to relate to me through a camera. And so I try to bring the camera out as, as, as fast as possible. Um, so we basically met uh, through a nonprofit that we had in common, the committee to protect journalists. Um, and after that meeting, they thought about it for a couple of days, and then I started filming literally a week later. Um, certain members of the group were, were more reticent than others um, to take part, and you know, like Hamoud, for example, it took a long time for me to um, warm, you know, him to warm up to me and me to warm up to him. And, um, but eventually, obviously, I was able to um, get him. So yeah, and the disease, you know, was instant. Um, so it depended on the character in each. It was definitely the hardest film I ever had to make. Sorry for the feedback. Um, it was definitely the hardest film I ever had to make, given just all the logistical sort of uh, inner workings of, you know, it wasn't like going to meet somebody in New York City. I mean, 
trying to find them, safe houses, communicating through them, with them, through you know, encrypted applications, um, you know, and finding them in places where they didn't necessarily want to be filmed, and then trying to find um, the sort of drama in what, for the most part, was just you know hotel rooms or safe houses um, and guys sitting behind computers and you know trying to find humanity in that was was really really difficult. Did you know that there was going to be a lot of that kind of um, that kind of downtime? You know, did you think that through before you decided? I'm just curious, as a filmmaker, that's very true that it's not exactly really dramatic to be with men in hotel rooms smoking, waiting for messages on their phones. It's hard to, how do you make that dramatic? How do you make that entertaining? Does that, did that go through your head at the beginning? Um, no, I, I, I try not to like overthink stuff, I guess, in the beginning. Um, I just try to, I generally just try to dive in and then, you know, shoot first and ask questions later. Yeah. And, um, but you know, very quickly, obviously, it became apparent that a lot of this, a lot of what I was filming, at least, was in these sort of boxed-in scenarios, and so um, I knew that I had to try to find this sort of visual language um, in a way to make it at least somewhat entertaining and, and accessible and, and human. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? So everything that was shot in Syria was by them.